Okay. Now, all of that was with regard to the topology of the how we can measure the quality of a network on chip purely in terms of its physical structure, right? But can I actually make use of all of these things? There comes the question of the routing algorithms that are used. Okay. And as far as routing algorithms are concerned, the problem of routing can be defined as how do I select a path from a given source to a destination in a given topology, right? And of course, there are many desirable aspects for any routing algorithm, right? The first thing that we need to understand is what we mean by the idea of a traffic pattern. Okay. And the traffic pattern basically says, are there nodes that are, you know, is every node generating new data to be transmitted on every clock cycle? Is it generating, you know, once in every 100 clock cycles? Is it random? Is it deterministic? Right? Uh, is it bursty? Right? Those are the different kinds of traffic patterns that we are interested in. Right? And the uniformity essentially says if it's like completely periodic and uniform and you know deterministic upfront, then there might be certain things that we can do. But if it is bursty and uh, random, and uh, you know of uh, the bursts are also of different widths each time, then it you know uh, it becomes even harder to sort of say what are the things that we need to do. Now, what do I mean by balanced load? We want to try and prevent bottlenecks from happening, right? We want to make sure that as far as possible, every data gets through from source to destination as efficiently or as quickly as possible. Minimizing latency is typically the goal, right? And one other thing which, since we have brought in this concept of a network, right? They also brought in this idea that can we tolerate faults, right? If you think about it in a normal bus-based system, there is no there was never a concept of tolerating faults in the system, right? That is to say, we always assumed that the chip is going to be reliable, meaning that it has already been tested upfront and that every link on this chip is known to work. If it doesn't, you basically have to throw away the chip and get another one, okay? Whereas now that we have brought in this concept of network on chip, now it suddenly opens up the possibility that maybe I can route around faults, right? If I do have a faulty link, I can just say, okay, avoid this and continue sending the data. This becomes important as we go to larger and larger designs. Okay, that's where it's primarily of concern. So taxonomy, right? Taxonomy basically means that there are different terms that are used in order to describe these routing algorithms. One of them is something called the oblivious routing algorithms, right? And an oblivious routing algorithm essentially means that this is something which does not think about the present state of the system or the present traffic in the system. Okay, it is just a deterministic or random algorithm, but one that does not really sort of change its behavior depending on the amount of traffic that is present in the system. Okay. Now, the other type is what is called adaptive. In the adaptive systems, there is actually something which basically keeps track of what is the amount of traffic and which links are congested and tries to route around them. Okay, let's take a look at some examples, right? There is this concept that is used uh, called very simple XY routing. Okay, and what we say is we are just going to do something called uh, dimension ordered routing. Okay, and what we are saying in dimension ordered routing is I want to get from let's say node 20 in this case right or 20 right if you look at the coordinates it's basically node 20 to node 11 okay so what do i do i know that i uh, given the source node it has a x coordinate of 2 and a y coordinate of 0 the destination node has x coordinate of 1 y coordinate of 1 okay so i know that i somehow need to reduce my uh, x coordinate right bring it from two to one. So I need to go to the left and then I need to go upwards. Okay. And that's it. This is always the route that it will take. Okay. It will always sort of say, uh, this is the one path that I'm going to do over here. It will first try to go in the X direction, get to the correct column and then go in the Y direction. Okay. Now, of course, the first example, there is pretty much only one path that you can take. 
right, in such a situation. If I have dimension ordered routing, I have to go along the x direction to get to the correct place. From 2, 0, the only thing that I can do is move to the left. Okay, So I can basically only do this. And then the next thing that I can do is basically go upwards. Those are my only choices. On the other hand, if I have a torus, I have a little bit more flexibility. Right? Once again, I do the x dimension first. But after that, I could either go up this way to 1, 2, or I could go along the torus, right, this way. This is also two halves either. This is essentially saying first x, then y. That is what I mean by this dimension ordering, okay? It's just a choice. The point is, if I don't put such a restriction in place, I can potentially end up with a deadlock situation. Let's say that uh, 2, 0 is trying to communicate to 1, 1, and at the same time, 1, 1 is trying to communicate to 0, 0, okay? What I would end up with is, this does this, right? And 1, 1 would then go at the same time towards 0, 1, okay? So this would be step 1. Then I would basically go upwards over here, 2, and this would become 2. So this is okay, right? Everything works out well. On the other hand, I once again want to do this communication. Let's say I try doing this and this at the same time. Okay, so in other words, this is step one, right? That basically becomes a bottleneck because now one zero is trying to receive data from two different places, right? And it basically cannot send out both the signals together. Dimension ordering is an example of what I called oblivious routing, right? Because what I'm saying is, it doesn't matter what the condition of the network is. Is there already some traffic happening in some other link? I will always try to send it along the x direction, right? Until I have got to the correct column and then start moving along the y direction. Okay. Whereas what we have over here, the next one is something called adaptive routing. So in adaptive routing, essentially what I'm going to say is this thick line that I have drawn over here is essentially a congested link, right? What I mean by a congested link is, let's say there are a lot of packets going between 11 and 12, right? And I know that, for example, you know, if I try sending something to 11, there is a good chance that either it will get held up in some buffer or it will get delayed. Essentially, there will be some congestion and there will be some delay when I am trying to communicate along that 11 to 12 link. Okay. Now, an adaptive router in such a situation would basically be able to say, let me look at that, right? I will send the data to 11. 11 now makes a decision on where to send the packet next. Okay. And as far as 11 is concerned, all that it knows is the final destination is 13. Okay. So it knows that sending the data back to 10 does not make sense. On the other hand, maybe sending the data off to 12, uh, 2, 1, 21 would be helpful. Okay. Why? Because 2, 1 can then send the data up to 2, 2. From there, I could go back to 12 and then go to 13. Okay. Clearly, I have increased the number of hops. But on the other hand, I made sure that the data actually got through. Right. And the fact that the 1, 1, 2, 1, 2 link was heavily congested or in fact could even be broken, right? I managed to work around that, okay? Now, what's the catch over here? In order to do this perfectly, I need perfect global knowledge of all the links, right? And generally speaking, that is very hard to do, right? Unless I have like something which is continuously monitoring every single link in the system and saying, okay, this link is good, this link is bad, now calculate shortest path from 10 to 13 and then send it along that path, right? If there was some global sort of, you know, magical entity over there that was capable of doing that, then yes, this is good. It works out. The problem is instead what we will typically do is, you know, what happens on the second picture, right? From 00, I'll send it up to 01. Now at 01, I know that my destination is 22, right? So I have two choices. I can either go up to 02 or to 11. Right, but the link on 01 to 02, right? This is 
slightly more congested. than 0, 1, 2, 1, 1, okay? So now 0, 1 has to take a, uh, take a decision. It has to decide whether to send the packet up to 0, 2 or to send it to 1, 1, okay? What does it do? In this case, it says 0, 1, 1, 1 is less congested, sends the data there. Now 1, 1 looks, where, where does the destination have to go, right? It has two choices, either send it up to 1, 2 or send it on to 2, 1. Once again, right, it sends it to 2, 1 because there is less congestion there. But now we have run out of options. I have finally reached 2, 1 and I am forced to take this. Right? So there is a possibility that if I am just making decisions based on local knowledge, right, I can end up with a scenario where I end up getting a bad final decision, right? Because I was not able to sort of look at the global picture and know that, you know, I am going to hit a bad link further down. On the other hand, if I decide that I'm going to try and have some kind of oracle that, you know, keeps track of every single link and decides on the best choices for every packet, the computational load on that will become too much. Okay. In fact, what we see is that, you know, even with regard to computer networks, right, the way that the internet itself works is something like this. There is no sort of global routing entity that keeps track of every possible link and says, okay, you know, send the data this way or that way, right? Every uh, router basically makes local decisions based on what it is seeing in its immediate surroundings. Okay? If it sees a congested link in some place, it will probably just ship it off to another link that is less congested in the hope that the data will eventually make it back onto a good link. Okay, so this is adaptive routing. There are many problems that it can solve. On the other hand, it can also lead to complications. So now the question is, how would you implement this kind of routing? Okay. And uh, because think about what we are saying over here, right? Now, effectively, each of these is a, each sort of cross point over here is a network switch, right? The nodes themselves might be computational elements, but there has to be a network switch at each of these places, right? Which means that there is something which is basically capable of receiving a packet of data, right? Which is just some set of bytes. It either stores it in a local RAM or in some shift registers. And then it has to take a decision, right? It has to compare something about where the data is supposed to go and finally make a decision on which way to send it. Okay. so. That network switch, I don't want it to become too complicated because then that will, you know, sort of uh, take over the complete complexity of the chip and probably make the chip twice as large as what it needs to be. Okay. So if I want to keep it simple, right, what are my choices? One thing I could do is something called a table based routing, right, which is basically saying that I'll have a lookup table. Okay. Now, the simplest form of table-based routing is that every source node has a path that it wants to follow when it wants to get to a destination node, right? So for example, over here, let's say that I want to go from 10 to 13, right? 10 will, 10 will give the path as 10 to 11, 221, 22, 212, 213. Okay. Now, why would it have something of this sort? Maybe because at some point, right, somebody computes this path uh, or it is just hard coded into the system. Right. But whichever way, essentially what happens is that the source node gives the complete path to be followed from source to destination. Right. In terms of hardware, this is very easy. The intermediate switches have a very easy job, right? As soon as it receives a packet, it just looks at the routing table that has been given by the source node, takes out what has been done so far, looks at the next node, forwards it. Okay. The next node then looks at it, takes out what has been done so far, again, looks at the next node, forwards it. Okay. So the implementation of individual switches becomes very easy, but Deciding what this path should be is a tricky problem. 
right? I mean, you'll have to decide it upfront ahead of time for every single pair of node combinations and sort of store that into the system. Okay. And well, as such, it cannot adapt in the sense that I can't really change this at runtime. Okay. Unless I have some other mechanism by which I actually update this table. By itself, the uh, tables are not capable of sort of storing that information. Right. The other way of doing is to say that I at each node, at each switch, right, the router nodes contain just the next hop information. Okay. So what could the next hop information be? Just think there are of the XY routing, right? The dimension order routing that I talked about. Over here, every node would essentially say, I know that you know, if I'm getting something in the X direction, then my next thing is, uh, you know, I, essentially it would just be a question of, if I got a node that wants to go in the X direction, I need to send it to the left, okay? Whereas if I want to have a node that wants to go in the right direction or uh, in the Y direction, I need to send it up, okay? And that information would just be stored at each node. Right? So the nodes themselves have very simple information that they don't need to worry about. Okay. Once again, easy to implement, right? Uh, in the sense that the router nodes themselves contain limited amounts of information. Adaptation is possible. The one tricky thing over here is ideally this next hop information should be dependent on my target, right? Dependent on where I'm trying to go, right? So unless I know which is my destination. I should not always be sending everything to the same next hop. Now, these are the simple kinds of routing implementations. A more complex one would be something called an algorithmic implementation, where what you do is to actually do some computation based on the source and destination addresses. Okay. So an algorithmic implementation would be something where you know you actually have logic, you have a sort of a small processor itself sitting out there, which is actually doing certain kind of computation. It takes all this information about the various, you know, uh, the uh, link congestion and so on, does some computations and finally decides where to send the packet next. Okay. Now, the next thing to look at is something called switching strategy, right? So you might be wondering, I mean, what's the difference between routing and switching, right? At the network level, at least, you know, in computer networks, Typically, switches are considered a slightly lower level thing than routers, right? Routers actually have some intelligence. They need to look at the destination and make a decision on where to send the, uh, which is the next hop to which to send the data, right? Whereas a switch is something simpler. So in this case, in this context, what does a switch mean? And what we have is, you know, it's basically trying to solve the problem of how are the network resources allocated to data? That is to say, how do you connect two different nodes together, right? A routing is what I've described so far is a special, is, uh, you know, referring particularly to one subset of things called packet switching, right? Whereas what I would like to do is to do something called a circuit switching, which means that P1 and P2 are, have always got a set of links that are assigned to them through which they can communicate. Now, if you think about what happens during a telephone call, right? A telephone call is an example of circuit switching because I am guaranteeing that if I am talking to you, right, there is always a way by which the data that I am sending out will reach you within a certain amount of time, right? I'm even giving some kind of latency guarantees and so on, right? Packet switching, on the other hand, says that that's what the internet does, right? It basically says that I will break the data, you know, if you are trying to watch a video on YouTube, the YouTube data center is somewhere. The data coming back from YouTube is broken into small packets and is then routed across whichever link is free and will eventually reach you. It might have an unknown latency in the process, right? We'll try and keep it small, but on the other hand, you're not guaranteeing anything of the sort, right? Now, nowadays what happens is people don't usually use circuit switching as such in the sense that it's very wasteful of resources, right? I can't really afford to dedicate a link to communicating. For example, if I want to talk to you, I can't really say that I'll always have one line which is always there in the moment I pick up the phone, you know, the connection is established, right? 
So what is usually done is something else called virtual circuits. That is to say, you build a kind of a switching, uh, a circuit switch network on top of a packet switch network by giving the impression that there is a dedicated link between these two points. Okay. Now, circuit switching, in other words, basically says that I am going to guarantee some kind of connectivity between 0, 3, and 1, 1. Okay. There has to be some sort of... Uh, negotiation stage, right? Which means that usually the way that you would do it is, I would go from 0, 03 to 0, 02 to 0, 01 to 11, 1, 1, mark all those links as occupied, and basically say now all of these have to be kept free for communication between 0, 03 and 11, 1, 1, right? 11 1, 1 will then acknowledge going back to 0, 01, 0, 01 will acknowledge going back to 0, 02, 0, 02 will acknowledge going back to 0, 03, and at that point, you know, with these two traversals, I have finished setting up the circuit. Once I finish setting up the circuit, the next step is the circuit utilization, where I'm actually transferring data, right? And during that time, what happens is that I've already guaranteed that all of these links are available for me. I don't need to worry about contention. I don't need to worry about whether the link is heavily loaded or not. I know that it's there. I can always send it. Packet switching is a case where I have a large amount of data to send. I don't want to sort of set up a dedicated circuit. I mean, I, I could if I wanted to, but you know, rather than setting that up, I would rather just send the data in those individual small packets, right? The idea of being a small packet is that it does not occupy any one given link for too long. On top of that, what it could also mean is that I could sort of send it along different routes. Right, which means that I can make better use of the bandwidth available in the system. Right, Packets go along different paths and then finally reach the destination. There is no startup time because I don't need that negotiation to say that all of these links are occupied. Right, And one big problem is that this thing called quality of service, saying that I can always get a data packet from A to B within a fixed amount of time. That's also hard to guarantee. Okay. There are many variants on this, right? Primarily in terms of if I'm getting some data, right? That is, I want to send data from A to B and it has to go through some kind of a node in the middle, right? What should I do with the packet? Should I wait at this intermediate node, right? Should I store the entire packet and then forward it? Or as soon as I know that the destination is meant for B, do I sort of do something called a cut through switching? Meaning that as soon as I see the first few bits of data, the rest of the bits, I straight away start forwarding them to B. Okay. So these are variants, which I'm not going to get into, right? But a lot of that also needs to be taken into account when you are designing these kind of networks. Okay. So store and forward would basically sort of, you know, the router would need to receive the entire packet check that the link between A to B is now free and then send one entire packet at one shot, right? Increases the latency compared to this cut through where, you know, as soon as A receives part of the packet, it automatically checks is B ready and starts forwarding it immediately. Okay. And because of all of this, right, in the NOC terminology, they define something called a flit. Okay. And a flit basically stands for a flow control unit. This is a terminology which is different from typical computer networks, right? The concept of flit is not really used in a computer network. Over here, there they just sort of stop at the concept of a packet. Whereas over here, what they say is they'll break it down further into a flit. And the idea of a flit is that it is even smaller than a packet. I could have multiple flits being sort of, you know, being transferred across uh, in from A to B, right, one after the other. And only when multiple flits have then arrived and been assembled together, that's when I get a complete packet at the destination. Okay. There are some, you know, additional terminology such as wormhole switching and so on, which I'm actually going to sort of, sort of just skip over at this point, right? Because this is additional detail, which is probably not terribly important to know. That. It's just data. Right? You can read through this. I'll be putting up the slides anyway. And finally, there is this concept of flow control. Okay. 
Now, flow control is important not just in the concept uh, in the context of networks on chip, but for any kind of communication link, right? The simplest form of flow control you would remember is something that we discussed earlier called the access stream protocol. Okay. And the idea of access string protocol was basically just a FIFO handshaking. Right? If A wants to communicate to B, B has a signal by which it can sort of send back to A saying, don't send any data now. Right? Essentially, it would say it is not ready. B is not ready. Okay, so it would deassert the ready signal, set ready equal to zero, and A is not supposed to send data at that point. That brings in this concept of back pressure, right? At any given point in time, if there is some block somewhere in the network, right, some module is not able to accept data, it can push things back. Essentially, the buffer at C would fill up. That would push data, you know, push a signal back to B saying don't send. B in turn would push the uh, signal back to A saying don't send, right? At some point, all of these buffers, C, B, A would all fill up only then. So in other words, B will not send back a signal to A saying don't send unless B has also filled up, right? Just because C filled up at some point, B should not immediately send back a signal saying don't send any more data. As soon as B fills up, it can send data, right? Flow control itself can also be done in many different ways, right? And Ultimately, what we are trying to do is implement P4 buffers, right? So all of these concepts like credit-based switching, right? It's just in some ways, a fancy way of looking at a P4 buffer, right? What it says is this node up here has a certain number of credits that it has. In a, you can think of it as the how much buffer capacity is there for the data which needs to come out of that node. And every time it puts a packet of data or a flit of data out onto the NOC, it decrements that count. Okay. Now, why is this useful? Because it's a generalization of the idea of a FIFO. Rather than sort of having explicit FIFO buffers in every one of these uh, units, the switches, right? I can now basically bring in this concept simply of saying, that each one of those units is given a certain number of credits, it can keep on transmitting flits until its credit count goes down to zero. And I can then refill that credit count as and when the link becomes ready, right? So the order in which I take out the data and the order in which I refill the credits could be made different, right? So as and when the receiver, right, is ready, it can basically send back credits and say, right, I, I will basically sort of top up the credits that you have and you can, you know, uh, now start sending data once again, right? So in this case, what we are saying is initially it has two credits. It transmits one set of data, goes down to one, transmits again, goes down to zero, and here it has to wait, right? As soon as it receives a credit, right, it goes up to one. It receives another credit, but it also transmits, which means it remains at one. Okay. And then finally, what happens is that, you know, we have this thing where, uh, once again, uh, as and when it receives a credit, this would go up. So you know, I think in this case, this should basically uh, go up to two. Okay. So the idea of credit based switching is in some ways a generalization of the idea of a FIFO. Rather than saying that I explicitly have buffers with certain capacity, I can now make that concept virtual. I can give each transmitter a certain amount of data that it is allowed to transmit, and I can change that at runtime if I want to sort of change the amount of buffering and how I share it among the different transmitters. Okay. Then in terms of flow control itself, right? I mean, the way that it is physically implemented would typically be some kind of an on-off flow control, right? Like I said, the simplest version is just the ready valid signal. But what we could do further is, you know, have some kind of a hysteresis, right? And the idea of hysteresis is simply to prevent this sort of, you know, you might have a situation where the FIFO becomes full, I send back a don't transmit signal, one data gets read out, Immediately it says, okay, now ready, transmit. You know, I immediately get one more data. 
it's once again full i send back a, a you know back pressure signal so it sort of starts oscillating right to prevent that what we say is let me put some kind of a gap between those thresholds the on threshold basically you know once the amount of data in the fifo the fifo falls below the on threshold right i can start transmitting and the moment it goes above the off threshold i immediately tell it to stop because i might have a situation where i actually have you know it takes some time before the off signal goes and actually stops the data from coming in right so i might even send an off signal like a few clock cycles before my buffer has actually filled up in which case my on signal would be something which just i back off and you know don't sort of send it until my buffer has fallen below a certain 